From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. <laughs> there we go. So we're complete now. We have a guest. Yay! Welcome, guest. Elias Krim Hi. is joining us. Hi, everybody. Hey. So we've got a couple topics, but I before we uh, get into them, I want to say a couple things. We are still trying to sell our house, so if anyone is <laughs> looking for a, if anyone's <laughs> looking for a lovely thirty six hundred square foot home in a beautiful old neighborhood in Saginaw, Michigan. Yeah. We're trying to sell ours. Right. So yeah, it could be yours. And um uh the the listing price is currently seventy five thousand dollars. Yeah. One of yeah. the people that uh attended a showing today apparently told our realtor that she, that uh he would consider offering twenty thousand. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so we're oh, kinda yeah. like hmm. Uh, Patience makes what? Patience. Patience. Oh yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we bought it at one twenty eight in twenty ten. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Mm. And we're we're, we're 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 in deep trouble. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, a kind not. way to put it. That's a kind we're way right. to put it. Uh, well, but there is some lie. good news. Yeah. Um, so last week was our fiftieth consecutive show. Yay! And uh, we started doing this. Uh, we did our first su summer rerun in this current series of shows uh, last um, June 18th. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, we didn't get a show out for a few weeks. But then we started um, with conversation number 11 on mm -hmm. um, August 6th. Nice. And so since then, we have got, <clears throat> gotten a show out nearly every Sunday. Yes, we took a brief hiatus around Christmas. Yeah, and we've missed one or two, and we've included a couple reruns. But uh, other than that, that's 50. 50 shows. Wow. Yeah. Qu question, and, question from the floor. Yes, please. <laughs> are you guys aware, are there very many couples podcasts? I don't know. Well, actually, I, I think this is a bit of a thing. I, I think it is. I think it is a thing. I only know of one other, yeah. which still may not quite make it a trend. Yeah. Not enough. I'm aware of the Professional Left podcast, which is done by a, a couple. Yeah. Who did? Oh. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of any others. No. Really? So, yeah. It seems a little bit oddball, but I, I think it might be a thing. It might be a thing. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I've been listening to Liz and Matt Brunig. Oh, okay. They do a show yeah. together? A show. And okay, they're, so. they're very different. Yeah. Um, but there's something about these kinds of shows. I don't know what it is. It sort of, in an odd way, reminds me of the really, really old TV and radio show by George Burns. And oh, Grace yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, ours anyway, I think. Yeah. It's a yeah, right. yeah. So, yeah. We, we should end it that way. <laughs> Kind of comedy. Mm -hmm. It's great to hear. You know. Oh, thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, we should end it. I should say, say good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we've done I, that joke sometime. We have. No, I've never. Uh, you know, I'm I'm too young to have seen that show back in the day. That was quite a while ago. Oh, but, yeah. But I I am kind of aware of the this. I've seen bits of it. You know, yeah. And quotes from it. But um, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah I'll be fifty-one years old, and this is our fifty in September, oh, and this is our fifty-first yeah. show. Okay. So nice anyway. touch. So yeah, actually, we wanted to open it up to the audience too. Um, if you have any ideas what we should do with this <laughs> podcast, thing, we'd well, be open. You know, like what do we? Yeah, you know, what should we be doing? What would you like to hear? If you've been listening for a while, or even uh, this is your first show, what would you like to hear us talk about? Right. So, and people have told us and given us ideas. We get and, a little feedback now and then. Yeah, and I I collected some ideas a while back, and the one that really keeps uh, is hanging with me that I haven't um, finished the research on. 
Well, yeah, yeah, because I really want to do a coherent show on the American Revolution. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's been sitting for a while. Uh, I'd love... I haven't forgotten. I'd love for you to be able to do that. It's To do it properly, as you point out, requires a significant amount of research and preparation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, and and uh, prep. More, yeah, prep yeah. more than the research. Yeah. I, I've got a lot of it, okay. like, sort of at hand, but I need to organize it and, and prep it. Yeah, for, for a coherent presentation. Yeah, there are some great history podcasts that I listen to. Yeah, and I'm I'm just a little hesitant. I, I'm not I'm not doing a history podcast. Right, your goal so, isn't to jump into that. that yeah, I'm not doing that. Some people, yeah. lots of people, are doing it really well. <clears throat> um, I don't want to say anything about that. I I really do want to do a little bit more, um, interpretive work. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, use that information to help people think about what it means. Versus just you know exposing the information. Maybe yeah. you can get people to get their heads straight about Hamilton. <laughs> for, exa- for example, for example, that would be good. Yeah, I mean, no, and don't get me wrong, I love the music. Yeah. It was well done. Yeah, my children have all listened to it and know many of the songs. It's great. <laughs> Joshua had parts of it memorized. Yeah, it's, I'm not making some kind of claim about how horrible rap music it is and no, no. how it should not uh. be connected to the American Revolution. It's no, it, it's <laughs> just a little bit perverse. To lionize a man like Hamilton, the way yes. the way that it, that it, it does, yeah. and even he based it on uh, Chernow's biography, right? Which is oh, does not entirely uh, lionize Hamilton. No, know? it's 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 a little right. more honest than the than yeah. the musical is. Oh, yeah. is that right? I didn't know that. Didn't yeah. Know. So uh, th- now, mind you, it's still it's still a little uh, neoliberalized. I think right. Chernow handles them with kid gloves. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't okay. call them out. Okay. Um, I mean, the Whiskey Rebellion was his thing yeah no, i, I and, listened yeah. and, and during my commuting i listened to Chernow's books on washington and hamilton i didn't I mean, that's the thing is the audiobooks are uh, abridged so this right. i didn't get the whole experience which would have been like a 30 hour audiobook <laughs> journey <laughs> but of i faith. did the best i could <laughs> yeah and they were quite interesting but um but but, but he does, still he does handle them with kid gloves yeah yeah, to, yeah both of them to some extent yeah right so anyway so anyway that so i'm i'm aware of that and that's still on the deck for me but i'm i'm open to other ideas and other suggestions about what we should do and what the show should be what guys want to what people want to hear yeah i'm i'm wanting to do more rather than less time whereas some of my friends are saying oh, it was over <laughs> it was two hours i couldn't listen to it I'm like well did you try the four hour one because <laughs> <laughs> right. to me the cure for too much is more <laughs> is more you know yeah, yeah. no we'll we talk. yeah talk. i'm not sure what a half hour show would look like by us we can't yeah. even uh take well, you know, no right yeah it, it would be mr rogers neighborhood anyway which you know by the has time by the time we got our our uh, cardigans on and our shoes changed it'd be, show will be over yep all right so um yeah but we talked about longer show we talked about if i don't think we can go more than one day a week we're already like abandoning oh, our everything. children <laughs> yeah it's all we can do to get this one out um yeah but uh, do you want to do longer, do more prep? I'd like to d- add live music. I'd like to do more production stuff, like um, yeah. uh, more audio clips and stuff like that, which I just, you know, I'm, it's usually I'm, I'm trying to produce the thing and finish it by 1.30 or 2 a.m. on Sunday night. And, you know, it's all I can, it's literally all I can do to get it out and still make it to work the sure. next morning. Right. Yeah. So, so idea is welcome. Yep. Yeah, but no, we we brought Elias on the show to follow up. Yeah, he joined us uh, at the start of um, July. Start of July, we figured, here's the start of September, let's see what's happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so how's the, how's the book coming? I know you're working on a book about your trip to yeah. Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm um, enjoying it and realizing that this is a little bit larger subject than I thought. It is still a travel book. <laughs> funny old mm-hmm. folk. Um, yeah. I recently had lunch with a guy who was on the trip with me. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the guy who was our designated Russian translator. Mm-hmm. He was a South Side Chicago Irishman. Uh, a very funny, wonderful, wonderfully smart guy who spoke French, Russian, and Polish. Well, all right because he was writing a a dissertation on um, sort of the contrast between Polish and Russian history books 
um, of uh, the 20th century. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're going to be yeah. different. Imagine yeah. what that might be. Anyway, a very wonderful guy. And we never quite knew what he was up to until sometime after this trip back yeah. in 1938 when we discovered he was finishing at a Jesuit seminary. Oh. He became a Jesuit, mm -hmm. wound up moving to Rome and running one of the um, institutes in Rome. This one was for the Oriental Church mm -hmm. um, and all kinds of other interesting things. But a wonderful storyteller um, who'd been to the Soviet Union and, and then Russia many times. And he and I, as I say, got together a couple of months ago and just had a great time kind of reliving some of the trip. So that freshened up my memories. Mm -hmm. Also, I was telling him, as long as I'm going to try to build this little soapbox, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the way I now see the Cold War very differently. Mm -hmm. And so I've been reading a bit about that and realizing that uh, in a way, you know, I got some of it on right. the trip, meaning Russia, what Russia really was. Right. And Russia. And then in other ways, I definitely had a kind of a blinder on. And now I'm, I'm looking at kind of the larger picture and the way in which that empire, in many ways, now I see resembles our empire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That's kind of oh. weird. Yep. Oh. Yeah. And, and, to, and to be clear, I keep saying Russia and it's Russia, but at the time it was the, the Soviet Union. The yes. Soviet Union. Right. And so you were behind the Iron Curtain. I was. In the Soviet yeah. Union in 78. Yeah. 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 So, so at that time, it, it looked like it was holding together mm -hmm. very nicely. It was in a kind of um, a defensive posture. Brezhnev was not trying so much to export revolution as mm -hmm. he was just to productively hold things together while kind of quietly persecuting dissidents. Right. That's pretty much the order of the day right. when we in 1978. Mm -hmm. So the cracks were not too apparent. Right. Um, but now looking back on it, I, I can see them a bit. And I see that, you know, when I compare surveillance with surveillance, mm -hmm. when I see kind of uh, social breakdown with social breakdown. It's really interesting to um, have that point of reference. Right. Uh, because uh, at the time, you know, I had no sense that these two um, great imperial schemes had anything at all in common. Right. They were polar opposites to hear anyone tell the sto story. That's right. Right. That's right. So so then there's this whole Girardian thing about, you know, mimesis in a way, you know, not only individuals, but I guess whole societies sort of imitate the other. Yeah. And in some ways we have turned into our adversary uh, mm -hmm. without mm. knowing. Uh, yeah. Some of that kind of crazy speculation is what I'd love to dabble in. Right. Well, and, and like it's not, uh, so we've turned into this other, right? Our, our, our reviled enemy. We, we have, you know, they did it in a very analog fashion. Right. Surveillance when I was there mm -hmm. meant that they already had our itinerary. They knew our license plate number. We were driving down designated roads and could not leave those roads, mm -hmm. attracting attention. Right. Um, and so we, we had a certain kind of surveillance in a very kind of old-fashioned um, way. Right. Um, minders. Yeah, you had yeah. minders. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. exactly. So, so t the truth was, as it was explained to us, as long as we did not really wake up the elephant— Everything was fine. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you just didn't want to wake up the elephant because then there was no putting it back to sleep. Um, right. But that's not at all. I mean, after all, the biggest difference is that in those days, I mean, what was going on in the Soviet Union was not voluntary. People were not offering, really, their information to the state in order to keep tabs on them. Mm -hmm. Right. But we've figured out a way to do that. Just get around that little... We're creating our own. <laughs> yes. Yeah. To, don't Every, just people get are eager, it. eager to give away sure. everything about themselves. Right. To the state. So, so yeah. there's that, uh, that whole thing.
<laughs> yeah, um, and when, when we, and when it, we sort of invert it in that way, that's right. Like suddenly, it's not the and same the thing. Inverted totalitarianism. Right. That, that, like, oh, it's this is all voluntary, so it's fine, right? No, right, right, right. So, wow. yeah. um, and and you know, the other thing about the trip that I'm I've been thinking about is that the guy that organized the trip um, made the point in the uh, in the brochure that this was a trip in order to give us maximum access to um, Russian citizens. And I didn't particularly think about that, mm -hmm. but he had a kind of uh, agenda. And the agenda was to create a trip where there was so much camping and driving mm -hmm. that um, surveillance was much more difficult to do. We're, we're out there at the campgrounds, oh, with yeah. the ordinary Russians hanging out, right. and we can talk to them and hear from them. And that was really a fantastic thing. It was not one of these prepackaged things in a tour bus yeah. where you had the guide from the Soviet tourist agency reading you the official line. We had that, but we also had plenty of time to hang out with just ordinary Russians. And that was the great thing. Mm -hmm. so what, I, I, what I heard um, from like friends and family who had been on like sponsored tours and official tours and whatnot was that they, whenever their tour bus was going through a neighborhood, they had the, the, the tour guide who was saying, and now if you look out on the left and then say, you know, this cathedral, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And if you looked out on the right, you saw the thing that you weren't supposed to be looking at. And that's why <laughs> right. they were trying to, you right. saw the poor tenement or whatnot. You right. Know. That's, that's right. Right. So, so I, I had a number of impressions and some of them were more accurate than others, I guess. Mm hmm that I, that I had a certain kind of uh, ideological blinders on. But, but I, I th I've been thinking more about the people and, and just really a larger subject, uh, which I'll try to weave into the book. And that is, I think there is a, a way in which it is true, as Russian intellectuals and theologians have argued for a long time, there is something different about Russia. And there's this idea that, that there's a Russian fate and the Russian fate is to teach the rest of the world a certain kind of lesson, hmm. mm -hmm. which can mean different things. Right. You can take that two or three ways. That's right. That's right. But as I learned more about Russian history and what we were seeing, you know, in the Ukraine near Stalingrad and just the unbelievable <clears throat> story of these people mm -hmm. and what they've been through um, in the last century or so, um, there are many, many things to reflect on there that are very foreign to the experience of the West and particularly America. Yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, we need to understand it better. Mm -hmm. I find it uh, as a, you know, literature guy, I f always find it really fascinating to read Russian novels and particularly mm -hmm. Russian science fiction and dystopian fiction, uh, yeah. because to me, they have the darkest, <laughs> grimmest, I know takes on on things ice trilogy there's a, a trilogy of novels called ice trilogy which is huh. deeply disturbing and grim and weird yeah. and then also um the uh, strigatsky brothers that right. did um oh that thing in the park the, the park but like the the zone the zone uh, yeah roadside picnic yeah a uh, very very dark worldview but fascinating so i'm always would, drawn to yeah. some of these i would love to see those some of these it's russian novels. An old uh, comment that R russians are not moderates that they are not um in the middle nope everything whatever is it is definitely extreme in one way or the other yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well there's a certain it echoes something i like to say about uh detroit and michigan and michigan about yeah. how you know detroit is the needle every american city has to pass through Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's Russia's got some of that, you know. It does the, uh, our lived experience is something that all humanity will have to come to no. understand? Oh, yeah, yeah, the collapse of an industrialized society. Yeah, everyone's yeah. going to have to. Well, and it even and it's not just like a modern thing. Right. This is a this is a Russian theme that goes way back. Mm -hmm. where, That's right. Yeah. So like That's the fall right. of their monarchy, the mm -hmm. fall of their yeah, it, all that you sort of like somewhat presages a lot of other All falls the revolution yeah. after right. revolution yeah. yeah and it's no. a learning that you know everyone needs to get that yeah i mean that's you can right. learn this lesson from us yeah 
So yeah. that also, though, implies that we should go there now and check out what our future is going to look like. <laughs> Precisely, right? Yeah. What, 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 what's, coming, what's coming for us? Yeah. And similarly with the state of Michigan for the, state of, yep. for the United States. Mm-hmm. You're yep. going to have to wrestle with this somehow. Yeah. The, the wonderful uh, Russian guy named Dmitry Orlov, who's been oh, interviewed yeah, yeah. by Charles Kunstler, right? Yeah. And oh, yeah. He, he has a, a book called Reinventing Collapse. Mm-hmm. It was back in that vogue of books around uh, civilizational collapse. But his is very insightful because he's using the old uh, Soviet experiences to say, you know, this is this is what it looks like. You know, mm-hmm. yes. this is what it looks like. You can do it too. <laughs> yeah, where it seems like an awful lot of Americans just are they they don't believe that any of this could happen no. because it's, no. the trend is always upwards. A so. lot of Americans have their fingers in their ear, yeah. while ears while they sing la 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 <laughs> la la la. I'm just gonna go to work and pretend this isn't happening. Yeah, yeah. We're the exception. We're exceptionalism. Yeah. yeah, well, not us. Yeah, here. I know, right. I know, I know, but right. not us. Yeah. No, no, no. So, so it's wonderful, deep stuff, and so I'm, I'm hoping to finish it up in a couple of months, maybe, and then I don't know if anyone will pay the slightest attention, but I'm trying to make it entertaining and really more of a travel book and not so much of a uh, sermon for crying out loud. So, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. we're really looking forward to. Reading we're looking forward it, to it. So. Yeah. <laughs> um. And I think a few weeks back, maybe even two months back now, you went to a socialism conference in Chicago. Ah, I did. I did. Yeah. That was such a wonderful, weird little excursion. You know, um, I got to say that um, part of the fun of this is that, as you guys know, I'm I'm a boomer. I'm one of these guys. I mean, <laughs> I, I always had the idea. You admit that in public still? Or? <laughs> after age 50, yeah. there's right. some somewhere that says you're really not supposed to change your mind about anything, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I, it's just astonishing to me how much I've changed my mind about. That's funny. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I, and I can't quite explain it. I, I give Pope Francis uh, some of the blame. Mm-hmm. Um, he should be blamed for everything. <laughs> really should. Uh, 2008 gets a lot, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so, so part of my, my uh, revision of my Cold War understanding uh, also has to do with other kinds of political systems, and there's lots of buzz about socialism and all that. And I saw this conference was coming to Chicago, which is an old socialist city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, a lot of history there. And I thought, you know, this would just be um, a, a fun errand to go sit in, you know, sort of Hunter Thompson style. <laughs> I, or you're starting out with the ether and then uh and then, <laughs> then the acid kicked in and all that i hope not I hope not. <laughs> you know just go do some gonzo thing here yeah. well you know that sounded like a little more than i was really up for but it was fun it was great fun to go to this rather nice thoroughly expensive neoliberal hotel mm. in the south loop um and hang out with i think i don't know three four hundred people Oh, good. oh, that's a size we'll get. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. Oh, it's shapes and sizes, and and it was it reminded me in some ways of an overblown teach-in. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, yeah. There were a number of people there, some older, some not quite so old, but they were they're uh, doing workshops, mm-hmm. numerous workshops that were dissecting previous revolutions, hmm. and we were sifting through the ruins trying to figure out what could we learn here, what went wrong, you know, why did this not follow uh, good ideological principles, what broke down, um, all kinds of different things. You know, it was, it was Portugal and it was the Russian Revolution and it was France in 68. Mm. And, um, 18, you know, 68. A very interesting, uh, you know, slightly wonky kind of effort to try to get our, our minds around what all that was about. Right. And then there were numerous other workshops that were more about sort of identity politics and things like that. Um, but it was um, sort of a weird combination of kind of a pep rally. Um, every time there was a, uh, a general session, things got a little rowdy and edgy and fun. And we started chanting about abolishing ice and stuff like that. Oh, that's always good. And then we break up. Go to the workshop on the Egyptian Revolution of 2011. Wow. Oh, okay. Wow. It was sort of fun. Um, it was sponsored by the International Socialist Organization, 
which is a particular kind of approach to this and works out of classical uh, Marxism and Leninism to some degree, but is not communist. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the other thing I concluded after sort of browsing the uh, rather nice bookstore they had here, uh, uh, had on site, was that they um, are not interested in certain other kinds of approaches, which would be thought of, I guess, as certainly social democracy, mm-hmm. mm. expect some kinds of democratic socialism, mm. and certainly nothing at all to do with figures that came out of any kind of uh, religious oriented socialism or revolutionary tradition. Right. So there's no Dorothy Day, mm. no King, um, you know, very little of um, solidarity, that kind of thing. Just yeah. Not, yeah. not really a subject. I think. That's disappointing to hear. It is disappointing. Because Grace and I are busily trying to actually broaden our understanding of socialisms, you know, and right. recently yeah. we started... We just started reading um, the Conquest of Bread, Kropotkin, and we're we're trying. I'm trying to wrap my head around some of these these huh. anarchist thinkers that people have been recommending to me. Sure, yeah, and, and look more at non-authoritarian, non-statist, you know, more right. distributed, more you know, egalitarian socialisms. So. Right, right, right. This seemed to be focused really almost entirely, exclusively on how to create a workers' movement. Hmm. So which isn't bad. Not, That's not bad. Which, yeah. which is in one way an important focus. But it also meant that other kinds of social efforts um, r- relating to you know, uh, other kinds of ownership or agriculture or you know, Kropotkin did not come up. Just, there really was very little, as far as I could find, of that. So really more... Uh, just kind of conventional and old style radical organizing. And, you know, as I think about it, one of the odd things about that is the unspoken assumption that we're still talking about organizing at a workplace. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're well, not addressing that assumption. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, can, I, can I just step back just a little bit yeah. here and just um, no wrong answers. I want to hear what you, uh, how would you describe or uh, separate socialism, socialism, from communism? How are they different? Um, Communism is uh, clearly the state seizing control of all means of production. Okay. Therefore, there is a a vanguard elite uh, that becomes party. The party makes all the decisions, Mm -hmm. runs the military, the security and so it's the power base. Right. Uh, the various socialisms come up with, I guess, different degrees of state involvement. But I would say, as far as I understand, don't assume that um, the state is seizing all of the means of production in this rather totalizing way. Okay. Yeah. Now, is that, that is that are, are there other communisms that are that sounds like state communism? Yes, well, that's then there's right. like our our anarcho communism. You know, yeah, maybe. people talk about our anarcho communism, our yeah. syndicalism, yeah. which yeah, is you know communism but um, no state. Yeah, yeah, and, and so and when you, actually communism without a state sounds like distributism to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're we're still still trying to wrap our heads around so, this because you know people don't don't you know come out of school typically having studied socialist revolutions <laughs> and like have a working vocabulary right. around the subject. Right. And, right. and I keep running into people with like just radically different vocabulary. Yeah. Like they're using the same words, yeah, but the vocabulary definition definition is just something else. The, something the one I, different. The one I've been trying to work out and and come up with really bring into focus recently have been words I see kicked around all the time it's the difference between um progressivism and and leftism or left organ you know left organizing oh, versus right. the progressive movement yeah and i try to so like okay w- w- historically what comprised the progressive movement and the, it sounds a little bit you were talking about how this socialist conference they seemed to very focused on on labor 
And Mm -hmm. that to me is like the progressive movement is to me very focused on labor, but not necessarily about overturning, you know, the the system is trying to make Mm -hmm. the system more just, you know, more remunerative to the the workers and, you know, and, and literally it was a matter of saving lives too, you know, that came out of the triangle shirt waste factory fire and things like that. But Mm -hmm. to me, that's progressivism, but, um, I can't get people to understand why that's not like the only leftist worldview. You right. Know? Yeah, so. that's the only thing on the left. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I really do wonder as I was hanging out with these younger people, um, I, I said in the article, I didn't mean to be snarky, I guess, but I said, you know, they look like a whole group of, of sort of angry skateboarders. <laughs> <laughs> but well, i get those, it those were the anarchists <laughs> those were the anarchists yeah <laughs> looking and yeah. you know the guy at the podium and say all right i i recognize the comrade with the pink hair <laughs> yeah thank you we called each other comrade by that's the way. I funny I was, yeah well, well they do this uh, even at our local dsa they call oh, the, really the, the group yeah. emails that go out to uh well actually they say the, the news emails that go out to everyone on their mailing list, they say friends and comrades, I friends think. And comrades. Yeah, that's right. Right. Today we, we actually went briefly to the uh, local Labor chapter picnic. Labor Day DSA picnic, which mm-hmm. was, it was fun. Oh, yeah. it was fun. Yeah. Glad to be there. I, I, don't, don't you think the opportunity here might be the fact that we're at a moment where truthfully, no one really has a very firm definition of what this word means precisely yeah i, I think th- th- that's that the old- is yeah mm-hmm. what it means is i i am not going to let the democrats do this to me one more time <laughs> yeah. am i right, you know am I right? yes yeah <laughs> not again not Hold again the damn football there's certainly nope. a lot of energy around that particular <laughs> feeling yeah, right there <laughs> I, at least that i mean that's not exactly a program but right, it's a starting right. point. but something it's you know yeah. it, it's a it's a start. Yeah, it's a starting point. I want yeah, to. It's not a funeral. I want to see if we can get uh, on the show sometime someone who was at the uh, Pittsburgh uh, Rust Belt DSA oh, yeah. conference because yeah. that was a thing that happened recently too. And I was trying to figure out if I could possibly go, and it just wasn't in it our wasn't in the cards budget and time and whatnot. But I'm I'm sure that some people from our local uh, Huron Valley DSA chapter went, and I'd like to see if I can get a yeah. debrief. Um, what happened? Yeah. What happened there? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh goodness! And, and just catch us up a little bit on Solidarity Hall. I, I've heard murmurs about new stuff in the pipeline, but well, yeah, we're, we're yeah, all right. I'm just doing a little blogging, and um, mm-hmm. I'm making a few people nervous as we seem to be moving toward a more focused kind of an activist, um, you know, set of ideas and right. and, and so forth. Um, you know, were ruffled. I, yeah. Because um, I think it's time. Okay, excuse me. I think it's time. It's time to, to do of, something. Yeah, right. Clock mm-hmm. is ticking mildly. So, so I've been dabbling in. Uh, Pete Davis and I are interested in this this movement from South America. the The Argentine word for it is horizontalidad, mm. horizontalism. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's a form of uh, anarchism, but it's really about the cities, and and the proposition is. The city has replaced the factory as the revolutionary arena. Right on. Interesting. Yeah. So what's going on in, in uh, uh, Barcelona? Hmm. Uh, the New Yorker has a piece profiling the mayor, this woman mayor of Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And he is all about um, this municipalism movement, which is really a wonderful thing because what I see in it is that it plays into sustainability localism, radical subsidiarity. It's got lots of great ingredients. Yeah, all the all the good pieces are there. You yeah. Know? All the pieces are there. It's, you know, whether or not you can actually organize it into, you know, mm-hmm. what it needs yep. to be is another question, but all the pieces are there. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and they've realized this is not about a system of autarky where we're just saying we're going to pull up the gates and and sustain just our city, there is a confederal dimension here. So it's my city and your city and three or four other cities. And at that level, we are collaborating. Yeah. And, and trading best practices and trading literally, maybe. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. 
And so it's it, what it represents in a way is the breakdown of the federal system. I mean, where do you go? Right you, on. It's local. And, and this gets really very interesting and very radical. Yes. Yes. And I, and I, I think it's important to note that there will be some, some really magnificent wins yeah. and some pretty tragic losses in that process. No doubt. No doubt. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to be, um, yep. I don't want to sugarcoat that or, or be sanguine or, or well, pretend agree. that's not true. It's not a controllable process. Right. And, sure. and I, I really feel like the folks who are always like, well, anarchy, how's that going to work? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and really they're like, so all these terrible things can happen. I'm like, yeah. And all these terrible things are happening. Right. So I don't know. Let's try yeah. something new. Yeah. 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 I, it would seem that they can only work as well as the health of your own community. Yes, yes, but and that's all we're talking about. And we and we have some communities that are really in trouble. That's yep. right. I mean, really. I mean, in just just terrible yep. fractures in yep. all dimensions. Uh, people yep. might not realize that they just at the start of the school year. So the right. the school year is about to start in the Detroit public school system. Mm -hmm. They shut off the water in a whole oh. bunch of school buildings. Oh. The entire school system. Every everyone. Right. Every school okay. in the Detroit public schools because has no water. They were all testing with uh, with such high lead and copper levels. Yes, they were the water's not safe to drink. They can't make it safe to drink. Yeah, and you know, so so now what? <laughs> you know, so how's that going to work? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know what that you know what comes next? What comes next? The city buys Michigan's water back from oh. Nestle. Yeah. Ugh. That's the next step. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and we could talk about Marathon and their polluting in the city yeah. of Detroit. And yeah. We could talk about, there's so many things we could talk about, right? Right. But the deal is, um, and I, I really, I really hope Detroit hasn't missed this window. Mm-hmm. But um, there was a moment in the last 10 years, and I think, I think the energy and the moment is still open, where um, Detroit could belong to Detroit. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. That Detroit was available for Detroiters. To, to, to own. To own. Literally. <laughs> literally. Local, local control. And to do something with. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not willing to say that that moment has passed or is gone and is irretrievable, mm -hmm. but the window's closing on that. Yeah. Right? yeah. You're, it, you're saying you hope maybe Detroit will actually enact on a sizable scale what Jackson, Mississippi is trying to do on a relatively small scale. Modest scale. Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, that'd be wild. That'd be great. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. You know? And I, and I could see a lot of people coming back for that. And that's one of the only things that has kept... Saginaw livable, even as it is, is the fact that Saginaw owns its water. Plant. Owns its water. Yeah. Some of the best water in the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Whenever Isaac's friends would come and visit us, they'd bring water jugs and <laughs> fill, fill up with our tap water. Because <laughs> they wanted to take their tap. To bring back to Ann Arbor. <laughs> right. Because the tap water was so good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's even that's been a boondoggle for the people in Saginaw. But yeah, it's yeah. it's a huge livability factor. Yes. Yeah. Right. That the water is, is clean and functional. There's potable water here. Mm -hmm. Um uh, Even so, if so some of the water yeah. mains are still made of wood <laughs> and yes. still falling apart in the winter. And, and mind you, yeah. that's less frequent than you would think with, right. you know, 19th century water mains that are made out of wood. <laughs> right. They still work. They still work. And so they have at least they don't leach lead. <laughs> Bingo. You know, details. You know what I'm saying? Details. Nope. Oops. Sorry. Yep. Small malfunction. <laughs> but we're okay. Everyone's safe. Um, but no, this municipality thing is very exciting. So you, you and Pete Davis are working on that, not to derail yeah, you. We're going to be interviewing uh, a guy that writes for a magazine called Roar, Roar Magazine. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, a little aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, but no, quite an interesting magazine um, of the left. And they've been focused a bit. I, I've done some coverage on this kind of direct democracy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, participatory budgeting. I mean, you know, how come everybody else has figured this out? And here in America, you know, we're, <laughs> we're like, hmm. Yeah. So Barcelona and, and uh, Medellin, Colombia, and, which is a complete turnaround story. It's now a wonderful place to be, evidently. Mm. Yeah. 
uh, and so on. Uh, but we're we're still trying to figure out how to how to get there. But it's uh, it's really quite fascinating stuff. That's some good stuff. I mean, I yeah. and I think there is something uh, that we should think about vis-a-vis, like so. How come we haven't figured some of these things out yet here? Yeah. Um. So I, I think, I think. Uh, we have, and we've actively shows, forestalled it. Shows them not to. Right, yeah. like for for example, there's I think, and I talked about this before. How Michigan um, effectively outlawed they made home rule of municipalities oh. illegal mm-hmm. back in the '60s. So like right. we thought about that and said, oh, we can't let that happen. Oh. <laughs> Indiana, right? did, Indiana so, did the same. Right. So we so on our on a state level, we have thought about this. Right. And yeah. made sure we can't have it. No, I guess that's right. right. And, and and I think that's not um, Michigan and Indiana aren't dramatic outliers in that respect, where mm-hmm. a lot of this municipality has been forestalled actively at a state level. Yeah. So the federal government doesn't even have to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. But, um, uh, you know, that state law is not necessarily part of the Constitution. That's right. I, I believe there's things we can do about that. No, right, right. Well, let me tell you a funny thing, not Saturday Hall, but just in my own backyard here. Um, downtown, there is a juice bar. And the juice bar has been owned now for two or three years by a very nice couple um, that uh, the guy had a job in Chicago, a rather nice job. He dumped the job, bought the juice bar, and then he got drawn into his neighborhood and what was going on in sort of neighborhood development. Mm-hmm. And 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 he got pretty good at it. And he also got interested in strong towns. Oh, yeah. 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 So he had a great conversation about strong towns. And now he is seriously noodling a run for mayor. Oh, hey. Nice. Oh, yeah. So I've been saying to him, Bill, you know, the reason I'm interested is not because I care about uh, these partisan debates or anything close to that. I think we could find a group of people in our little uh, leafy college town who are interested in a different kind of development, a different way of going forward. What we have right now is sort of economic hunting, not economic gardening. We have a proposal for a big transportation-oriented district project, which is built to a finished state, as Chuck Marone likes to put it. Mm -hmm. It's a big bang project. It's tens of millions of dollars. It will make money for a rather small number of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, It will temporarily employ some local tradespeople. Um, But it is not incremental. It is not fine-grained. It does not build urbanism. Mm -hmm. Nobody has any idea what it's going to do to parking uh, or the kind of dynamics of the downtown since it's just adjacent to downtown. But somebody needs to run and talk about this. And so this, this guy at the juice bar, my friend Bill, who's a wonderful, bright guy and really is into strong towns, really understands what Chuck's talking, talking about. He's about to announce, and I'm very excited because in my town, maybe like in a lot of little, uh, even red towns, there is really something bubbling. Yes. And it's great. Yeah, it's it palpable. Might, palpable. It might run the tables. I don't know. Yeah. The other side is just on fire, and and you know their idea of development is to act like a bunch of crazy free spending liberals and make these big bets on projects that may or may not work. See what and happens. And actually, <laughs> to the right of that, and say no, let's do lots of incremental projects. Let's let's focus on our backyard businesses. Let's build up the, the downtown retailers and so on. And I think it's a winning story. It's a winning solution. Yeah, that does sound like, from having heard Chuck lecture about that, that does sound like the approach of, you know, fund 100 projects, not one. (laughs) Or a thousand. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, really, let's let's do something for real. And I think the other plank in the platform that will be a winner is to just run on transparency. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, that be- but that's the the strong towns. This this piece of the strongest towns message. Mm-hmm. So, let's say you do one project and you put all your eggs in that basket, right. and you know it doesn't pan out. Right. right. 
you know, but let's say you do a hundred projects yep. and 75 of them don't work out. Right. right. You have 25 successful projects right. Right. for right. the That's price right. of the one that failed. Yep. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> and yeah. And he's talked about how some of those projects can be extremely modest, like just paint bike lanes or put in some flower put some planters. Flowers out or, there. Yeah, they, they I mean, can, it doesn't have to be a big deal. They can <laughs> start small, you right. know, trying to turn a, Make yeah. a strode more drivable, you know. Well, and, and some yeah. of these municipal projects, you see them, like they include like the flower baskets, right? Yeah, yeah. And the line item in the big project for the flower right. baskets <laughs> is like $250,000 yeah. or, you know, a million dollars for flower baskets mm-hmm. downtown. Mm-hmm. And you say to yourself... Who got the flower basket contract? I know. What Whose that brother-in-law about? Is, runs the florist? <laughs> runs the florist, right? And got the contract to keep them watered every day. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So the um, uh, when you do this sort of modest thing, this incremental thing, mm-hmm. no one's spending two hundred fifty thousand dollars on flower mm-hmm. baskets. Yeah, that's not happening. That's right. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know there's all kinds of pushback about why it costs two fifty two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but yeah sure. no yeah. yeah we were all rational people and we know that that's not what flower baskets cost right so yeah well you know what i'm wondering is if there is a certain population number above which things begin to change around your city hall or maybe they should change around your city hall they should be so different yeah we're a town you know a friend of mine is very conspiracy minded mm. and he is that all of the bad actors, in his view, down around City Hall and the developers, they all meet late at night while we're at sleep. <laughs> and they come up with these schemes. And I've tried to explain to him and say, look, no, man, that's not the explanation. The explanation is all these people went to high school together. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Like that. yeah. That's, it's but that. They deep. trust each other. And they yeah. and they meet at the diner at eight a.m. Yeah. You know, not right. the middle of the night. No, they meet at the diner at eight a.m. in broad daylight in a public location. You could sit at the table next to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So what we got to do is face the fact that after the town gets to a certain size, it sometimes happens. You've got to do business differently. Yes, you've got to get out of this paternal thing. Right. Right, right, and, and, and you know, this this friend this friend network thing. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, well, yeah. It's just it's so easy to do, but you know it has very bad effects. And and our town likes to talk about how we're so civically engaged, and then city hall does things to disengage us. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, we were talking yeah. about that at the picnic. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, a right. lot of the people at the DSA picnic are local folks who are trying to get some organizing done with groups working with city hall. You know, yeah. so with the with the city council and right. um, just and they the, disengage them at every turn. Yeah, just right. the way they try to pry them off of the you know try to minimize their work and shuttle them into right. stuff right. them back in their box and their their corner, their penalty box, you know, right. it's really, it's really, fr- even just hearing the story is, is frustrating. It's hard to imagine living it, trying to do it every, every day. If this is your activism. I mean, but, it's, there's a kind of a syndrome and it's, it, it's something about uh, defensiveness and some kind of fear of the public or the idea of the trouble, the public's just going to screw this up. You know, if you try to engage them and start holding charrettes, God forbid. Oh, oh my yeah. God, not that. <laughs> you know, um, no good can come of that. Well, no, and, and it's it's kind of like, you know, the 10th graders, they're yeah. having a sleepover. <laughs> and if they invite the new girl, it won't be the party they had in mind. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know? <laughs> and if you invite the people, that are the outsiders, to your yeah. party, oh, then it's not going to be the party you were thinking of. Right. No, control. Right. Control. And and I find most of us in most spheres of our life are still in the 10th grade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're like, well, don't invite the weird kids. You know, we don't talk to them. It's true. It'll be bad. It's mm. true. So you can't, you know, they can't participate. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah. I, I, think, I think the way to do this, though, I'll give you my personal uh, strategy. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and matter of fact, I think I mentioned this the last time we talked. I'm trying to be a goo goo. Uh, Mayor Daly's old term for the people from Hyde Park that come up and always want to talk about good government. Yeah. It just drives me crazy. You know, 
you know, they're just so, so impossible. But I, I try to come on not as a crazy radical, but as a goo goo. And then we quietly sort of smuggle in. I mean, this is Indiana. Smuggle the radicalism <laughs> under the radar. It's the best place yeah. for it. Night, at night when nobody's around. Right. Why do you think we record in the middle of the night? Yeah. Why am I still uploading this at 2 a.m.? Right. I think that's the only way we're going to get it done. Yeah. yeah. That's why we do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so that's, I, I think you're on to something. Did I, <laughs> did I put a bug in your ear already about sociocracy? Uh, let's see. I, I sort of vaguely know this word, but I don't really remember what it is. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it's branded for American audiences as dynamic governance because okay. Americans get frightened when they hear social things. Oh, yeah, right. 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 So, but uh, in Europe and other places where people have used this, hmm. it's, uh, they call it sociocracy. Yeah. And it uh, was developed as a, as a business governance model that's oh. more democratic. And in fact, hmm. really deeply democratic. Democratic. The book I would recommend is is um, getting to a um, um, getting to a deeper democracy. Okay. I'll I'll verify that title so I can put it in the show notes. But okay. um, it's a very oh. good book, and it's that's written for an American audience. Cool. But let me see if I can summarize it very quickly. Okay. So and how it would work, say, in a political setting uh, of a polity. So let's say we you know we have wards and we have city council and so on. And then in many places, wards are broken down even further. Yep. You know, you know. So let's take your smallest unit, say a neighborhood or a precinct. That neighborhood or precinct would elect, but I use that term loosely, because you mm -hmm. can't run. Yeah. Everybody votes for the person they think would do the best job. And the, two, the top two winners, because remember, nobody's running, uh -huh. but everybody's voting. And they select the members of their community they think would really represent them well. Those two individuals now have a role at the next level of government. Mm -hmm. Let's say that's the ward. So they manage your ward. So those two people like represent the precinct and they go to the ward. And each, so in, in the ward, all the precincts have a couple of people from each uh, precinct going to the ward to manage things what that need to be managed in this sort of like horizontal fashion uh -huh. now mind you what this is is integrating horizontal organization so that you can confederate across a wide area okay mm -hmm. so yep. every person who's in some some like senior level whatever it might be if you want to or you know think about it as a hierarchy huh. got there because the individuals in their community of origin thought they were the best person for the job Mm -hmm. Not, and I have to emphasize this, not because they ran for the position. So no one, there are no, there's no campaigning here. Huh. There's no campaigning. There's no like anything. Huh. So in a work setting, you know, let's say you've got a, a job unit that does accounting and, you know, you need to represent like what accounting needs to the next level. The accounting office would say, well, who do you think here should be doing that? And everyone by secret ballot would say who they think should be doing that. The name that comes up the most is the name that does it. Hmm. And so on. And there's a danger of a popularity contest. Yeah. But that's why you take two people. Mm -hmm. Right? Huh. You can usually break that kind of popularity contest dynamic by uh, taking the top two names because they're not necessarily, you might think they might be the two most popular people. It's usually a popular person and an extremely competent person is what usually happens. Oh, that's it. Huh. And the combination of their, the charisma of the popular person and the competence of the competent person <laughs> gets a lot done. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, that's the nuts and bolts of it. And they've done like some experimentation at a very low level of how you might use this to manage a large federation. And many, uh, many corporate entities throughout Europe use sociocracy to democratize their workplace <clears throat> as a functional method of government. Wow, cool. Hmm. So check it out. Um, the, I you believe know, I, you, yeah. on the website right now, and I want to see if you're aware of their blog post about strong towns. Oh, I haven't read that yet. No, that's amazing. Can you believe this? I am on the sociocracy.info website. Right on. 
Oh, this, no. <laughs> and they're talking about Stratton's house. Of course they are, right? That's hilarious. This is the sociocracy in civic life. Mm-hmm. The, the title of the post is Strong Towns and a Way Forward. Yeah. And it says, um, uh, the organization's methods for building strong towns are distinctively sociocratic. Yeah. Entirely practical and nicely framed. No unfamiliar names or distracting variations accepted practices. Mm-hmm. How about that? Yeah. Cool. No, so that's, cool. uh, that. I think it needs to be a conversation about municipalism and home rule and, and sort of local governance. Because there's always this question like, well, how about, how are we going to manage something like Medicare? Mm-hmm. In that universe, mm-hmm. um, we can do it. That's what federation's about. Mm-hmm. That's what confederation mm-hmm. is about. Is about connecting with, with each other right. for right. things that, where we where we have a shared concern. Very so, cool. I yeah. was not aware of this, uh, but it does seem very close, very close indeed. I can't believe the strong towns thing. Mm-hmm. We're talking about here. It also um, comes out. The municipalism thing comes out of this guy Murray Bookshin. And so Murray Bookshin is the um, uh, kind of rumpled Jewish uh, Greenwich Village philosopher who is behind um, a lot of the um, Spanish uh, indignados movement Mm -hmm. in Barcelona, of all things. Oh, that's weird. Like he just had friends? He had friends there? (laughs) Mayor of Barcelona, this woman, uh, Ada Colau, is all about Murray Bookshin. All right. And his form of um, municipalism, which he got, by the way, from ancient Athens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Read a lot of ancient uh, history. So, But these things tie together, obviously, very closely. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. very cool. Yeah, and the, the city-state was a city-state for a reason. That's right. Yeah, right. It, yeah it, not yeah. a state-state. <laughs> a state-state state for a reason, because it had a functionality that belied... Um, the infrastructure that we've built, the yeah. modern yeah. structure, yeah. And there's a certain granularity where it, it makes sense and works. It makes sense and it works. And well, actually, if you take, if you subtract our modern infrastructure, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what we're doing now for the state doesn't doesn't even make sense. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can we subtract our modern infrastructure? No. <laughs> I keep hoping, I keep hoping. But you know. I just wait. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, then we couldn't have chats with Elias. And, that that's you know. true. We do need a we need an internet. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not I'm not sure we need the state to have the internet. So. All right, All right. <laughs> well, what did Aristotle say? Aristotle said, you know, more than five thousand people, uh, you're gonna lose you're gonna lose control. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna be out of control. <laughs> He's onto something. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Right. I would sit at three hundred, but you know, <laughs> what do but, I yeah. Do? <laughs> do you want to move on to our? Um, our other topic, do you think we have time? How what time is it? it? I don't know. Where are we? Do you know what time it is always? <laughs> whatever you like. He says, he says, whatever you like. Oh, yeah. No. What what time have you got there? Oh, I'm sorry. I have 9.33. Okay. He's an hour behind us. So, yeah, it's like right. 10.30. Yeah. So, we've, yeah. we've been going about an hour or so. Yeah. So, this uh, this other topic is a little, a little more free form, but I... Um, You've, but I head did, up. You've been head up and I've been head up. I've been head up. And I, you know, just this week, I got, I got, I got enraged. I've been enraged. Uh, yeah. Well, no, see now, Paul's finally sort of tasting the rage that I've, <laughs> I've, I've, you know, oh, good. dealt with for decades, <laughs> and just it's not the first time, but this, it's, it's really, it's visceral now, yeah, right, yeah. right, and you can't quite, you know, put a cap on it. I, I know, I just kind of, it's, it's. What can I say? I come I'm to accept a, it now. I'm a hater. <laughs> just a hater. Well, that's what everyone says to me. I'm just a hater. Yeah. You know, why can't anything be good and pure? What's wrong with you? Really? Uh, n- no. So, so the particular the 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 impetus this last week is the death of a certain politician, a senator mm-hmm. from Arizona, that has um, liberals kind of gushing, you know, in this yep. somewhat perverse fashion, you know. Yep. I would call it a performative gushing. <laughs> performative gushing, right? And um, and what was it? Was it the New Yorker or the New York Post? New Yorker. So, yeah, it said yeah, this, this is the largest gathering of the resistance yet. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> it makes your head hurt, right? It does make your head hurt, right? It's kind of like, what am I? 
what am I even looking at? Yeah. No, I, and I've, what did I, I just read? <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm, I've not even been watching any of this on TV, but just through the lens of Twitter, which is like a, like an obsessive peephole, you know? <laughs> Yeah, they just yeah. they pointed at different things as like, they come oh, by your a little feed. Flash. Oh, yeah, little little clips, pictures, headlines, and and comments, snippets, and yeah. yeah, I I don't actually want to make this about entirely about McCain. I this week I collected a huge number of uh, articles and documentation and voting histories and things. Because that, here's the important thing. Yeah, it's not about him. It's not about him per se. What I what this is about is normalizing the fascism that's been creeping through American society for the last fifteen years. Yeah, mm -hmm. like fully normalizing it as our standard bearer of American life. When we were getting ready, I was <clears throat> saying to Grace. So at one point, it seemed like for a while there was emerging a consensus that maybe the Vietnam War wasn't a, a great and noble endeavor and success. Right. Yeah, that that seemed seemed to actually be becoming the consensus, bipartisan. Mm -hmm. That it was a mistake. Yeah, that was wrong. And yep. then, even more recently, it seemed like maybe a lot of the pundits and politicians that had been quite so gung ho about Gulf War One and Gulf War Two, about the invasion of Iraq, were uh, were having second thoughts and were willing to put it in print or in public saying, "Yeah, I was wrong." Was wrong. This was wrong of me. Now that they all have their, you know, sinecure, their teaching jobs and their, uh, <laughs> their posts as They got their editors. golden parachutes. Yeah. And now they can admit to how, how repulsive what they did was. Right. Right. Even people like um, Bill Crystal. Yeah. You know. So, oh, but it seems like that's uh, that's but just been washed away. We've managed to wash that all away. Yeah. Just clean the blackboard off. Under some kind of wave of of nostalgic, tear-jerking nationalism. I, I don't even know what it is. Well, you, you well, describe it. Well, I, I think it's... Crypt I've called it this for a while. I think it's crypto-fascism. Mm -hmm. Where it's, it's not the goose-stepping in the streets. It's no one wears insignias. Mm -hmm. It's not um, openly revolting yes. like seriously you're going to attack this woman in the street because she's whatever group yeah which uh, is happening which but, that's but happening this is not what, <laughs> that's, that's what i'm talking i'm talking about crypto fascism right. which has which is, accomplishes the same ends but it's just has a, has plausible deniability it's mm -hmm. part of it has to be that like all mainstream media is now state media yes Yep. And, and social media is now state, state media. media. <laughs> so social media, mainstream media, it's also and the, and the reason social media is state media is because everyone's getting all their information from the state mm -hmm. through the mainstream media. Yeah. And yeah. so this narrative where whereas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could look at ICE and you could say Dear God, right? We can't do this here. Right. This right. is the Gestapo. We can't have the Gestapo here. Right. To where now, um, you've got to defend that assertion. Like, why would you abolish ICE? Doesn't yeah. that seem radical? Right. That seems extreme. Don't you think so? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the conversation we're having now, rather than the 2003 conversation right. about you know we can't have the Patriot Act is. Like no, it's bad. It's just bad. There's nothing good here. Yep. You know, homeland security. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. can't do that here. Mm -hmm. We can no longer have that conversation. Homeland security is the department. You know, it's a cabinet level department. Yeah. And hey, there are lots of jobs attached to that. Right. Are you trying to put right. those people out of work. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It's I like, mean, that's the conversation I'm having with people. Yeah. No. Last last week we talked about how you know we can't have. A universal health care because all the people that mostly uh, women of color <laughs> low income jobs within the health insurance industry would right. lose their jobs. Lose their jobs. Oh yeah, that's, that's racist. Yeah. You know? you're, you're so this is right. Universal health care is is racist. It's actually racist. We have to keep doing what we're doing. Right. The contortions are just uh, they. It's just. Uh, I mean, they're bizarre. they're completely Orwellian. Yeah. People in yeah. my Twitter feed are saying. 
hey, I remember this little thing where we all marched against the war in Iraq and the media didn't cover it, you know? Yeah. Uh, did that never happen? Did that know? go down the memory hole? Yeah. And that's really what this, what we're watching unfold with this sort of national spectacle yeah. with this death yeah. is, yeah. To wa- is to really just scrub clean the whole mm. memory board mm-hmm. and start writing a new story and it's especially based on fi- complete fiction. Yeah, it's especially dispiriting, even with people who you think of as as left leaning. Yes, you know, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, Bernie Sanders, all these people releasing oh, statements that are just yeah. basically yeah. hagiographic. You know, just like wonderful life and career. Robert Reich, you know, it's on and yeah, on. Robert Reich. I I unfollowed about thirty people on Twitter, honestly, because I just the, couldn't take it. Just couldn't take it. Well, so, so a, qu- a question here is: um, someone called this the funeral of bipartisan self-regard. I noticed, you know, um, oh. that would fit in with this this performative nature. Yeah, it, yeah. right. It was also a very kind of elite kind of Beltway, yeah, you know, Kennedy Center kind of moment or something. Yeah, yeah. It's lots of garment ripping and wailing and beating yeah. of, of breasts. Yeah. And, and so, is it indicative of something, or was it just a moment? And and. You know, we don't want to read too much into it. I, I tend to think of it, if there's a broader thing going on, the broader thing I have uh, come up with is sort of Trump distortion syndrome. Mm. Oh, yeah, words, yeah. How Trump is rehabilitating, more or less single-handedly, the FBI, yeah. CIA, CIA, the defense budget, and it just goes on and on. Right. Yes. This is just... I- I certainly think that's part of it. And I think one of the reasons that so many Democrats, you know, are are, are groveling, you know, publicly is because yeah, yeah. they think that McCain was was the anti-Trump, you know. Yeah. Oh, somehow. And so, so it, by by doing this, they're, I don't know, owning the cons, you know. <laughs> right? yeah. We're going to own the cons. <laughs> by, we will, we will right. completely own them and make them look like fools. By joining them and giving everything they've ever, given them everything they've, they've ever wanted. wanted. <laughs> and, and I like that term, the Trump distortion syndrome. Yeah, yeah. That suddenly all these things that we've known for decades right. were, uh, is there any nice way to put it? Just, they're just trash. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, um, suddenly are now they're legitimate. They're, they're, they're legitimate. They're, yeah. they're good guys. Yeah. Because, you know, he did that one last minute vote against Trump, right? You know. What even Which was it? Quickly, I, yeah. Well, there are several cases like that where he did these very high-profile statements or votes, which were yep. quickly turned around or, or um, invalidated by other it was <laughs> less publicized profile. votes. It was because high profile was, because the media made it pro- high yeah, profile. Yeah, McCain was a real gift to the media, and he knew how to work yep. the media, and they loved him in particular because he gave them an enormous amount of access and loved to give interviews and... True. commentary right. and you know do his maverick act right so. and i have to ask myself right um was that the point of the trump presidency all along hmm. I, I don't know i'm just i'm just, I'm just the, the useful idiot theory of trumpism <laughs> well no that that all these things can be rehabilitated for public consumption again that the FBI and the CIA are all trustworthy. If we put and, in someone, if we you know, install someone who looks bad enough, everything else looks good right. by comparison. Right, George W. Bush yeah. was not a yeah. moron. He, he, gave, he gave Michelle Obama a piece Can, of candy. <laughs> he's a great guy. But no, seriously. I mean, and, and I remember during the, the Bush administrations, yeah. there were like two things that people would say simultaneously, that Bush was a moron. And that he was a evil genius. Evil genius, right? And I'm like, he can't be both at the yeah. same time. Yeah, no, people right? say that about Trump too. He's yeah. but he's not both. He can't be both. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. So suddenly he's no longer an evil genius. He's no longer a moron. He's no longer a war criminal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's he's a sweet old man passing out candy. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. it's just you know, don't you just feel warm and good inside? Don't you miss him? Right. Don't not you at miss all. Him? Yeah, no. I Not mean, at all. I miss him like I miss a canker sore. And yep. and people yep. don't realize who haven't been around long enough to remember Reagan oh. that mm-hmm. 
one day yeah, love yeah. of Trump will be taught in every child child's history class and, and in every textbook, and it will yeah. be undisputed, set in stone, orthodoxy that he was the, the great man, the great man the great theory. Dude. It's great, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you just feel warm and fuzzy and thinking about leader. him? Yeah. Do you remember the Christmas tree they had in the White House? How beautiful it was. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, like, uh, brutalist Christmas tree. <laughs> wasn't that beautiful? It was really, like, uh, understated elegance, I felt. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a fascist uh, Christmas tree. A friend of ours on Solidarity Hall, a, a very wonderful, smart woman, mm-hmm. has been uh, nudging me over her sense that I am forgetting that the funeral, if nothing else, illustrated a momentary return of civility. Oh my God. (laughs) No, not name calling and labeling Mm. and blah, 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 blah. Well, and the point I wanted to make was, um, you know, and, and, and sort of the, the sense that there was a time when the nation's system worked and all that, and there was uh, comedy and so forth. And so what I said to her was, you know, Years ago, there were moments when uh, the nation's systems did work together and some worthwhile things were done. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that has changed and they're not working well. And, and the solution is not to um, look, look for the center. You know, her idea is we've mm-hmm. got to get back mm-hmm. this because that's where um, things got done. And and my sense is, uh, I don't want those things done. Right, yeah. the things that the, the centrist Which, agenda. I don't want that to we happen. We don't want that to happen. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Whatever agenda you're talking about, it's yeah. probably not what we want done. You know. Yeah. When yeah. you when you put the the interests of billionaires and the interests of of poor people in a balance, and do what balances them out. <laughs> right. You do what works for the millionaires. Yes, right. exactly. Right. No, so there's that, no center. There's right. no center. It might be very disruptive. It might be disconcerting. It's not controllable. Um, but let us have no talk of uh, just some sort of happy middle here. Um, or that sort of faux, con- that faux civility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. not it's yeah, faux I'm, comedy. I'm uh, not yeah. sure who yeah, all these comments on Twitter by people saying I'm a I'm a lifelong Democrat, but today I am, you know, I love McCain and Megan McCain and all this. And I just have to scratch my head and say oh. <laughs> when you're performing like this, who do you think is watching and what do you think it's gonna get you? You know, hmm. they're not going to respect you in the morning, right? <laughs> no, no, they're not. No. Right, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna change their vote tomorrow because Be- of what you said on yeah, Twitter. Because the Democrats were were all t- speaking of bipartisanship and unity. Nothing's going to change on the on the right. You know, they're not going to no. soften their their, uh, uh, you know, projects. They're still going to confirm Kavanaugh. All yeah. this is going to move forward. Yeah, and probably the Democrats gonna are going to help them. Yeah. And so, they're probably going to bomb Syria. While this was happening, the Democrats were rushing through the appointments of like a dozen of Trump's federal judicial nominees. Right. So, And so I don't know what, I, I always, I keep asking, what are they resisting? What's the resistance right. resisting? <laughs> yeah. It sounds like they're resisting the general uh, public. In, in civility. <laughs> I guess. I guess. I, I, I'm, people, people now think res- resistance is Republican senators who refuse to have lunch with Trump. That'll show them. So there, like, yeah, not yeah. resistance. Or like yeah. Alan Dershowitz can't get lunch, can't get a lunch date on Martha's Vineyard, right? right. No one, no, they they wouldn't invite him to their parties anymore. Yeah, that's that's. So, they, they did article after article about about this controversy. I don't think they've covered the prison strike once. No, but they just say. talked a lot about Dershowitz not being invited to parties, uh, and yeah. how well, awful that was for him. Right. Okay. So and so this. This for me is the sort of like I was calling it normalizing fascism. Yeah. I really appreciate this frame that's like this Trump. Uh, um, what did you say? Tr- Trump distortion, distortion syndrome. Distortion, yeah. Like, it, like he somehow distorts things for your own mind. Yeah. Like somehow yeah. now you can't see this the way you saw it mm-hmm. three years ago. No, that's right. That's right. The facts as you knew them three years ago no longer exist because of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I. That's like some freaky state mind control right there. <laughs> the idea that all these people 
speaking at the funeral, including Henry Kissinger, for God's sake. Oh, my God. Oh, Don't speak his name in front of me. <laughs> they are all somehow part of part of a collective resistance to Trump, you know, is... But again, uh, mind you what I've said, my, my initial framing about crypto-fascism. Yes. What's important is that it's not vulgar. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there's plausible deniability. <laughs> and... Trump abandons both of those. Trump yes, yes, because he's engaged he in the only, same policy. Right, it's like you always say. He is only working. He's only speaking to his base, and he's right. only doing things to energize his base, and it works. And it it works. continues to work. Right, right. It's yes. a very effective strategy. He's, it's very functional. He's still holding rallies that look a lot like Nuremberg. <laughs> you know, they do. They really do. And and I think so. So if uh, if George Bush was was a kind of a moron. Um, yeah. I wouldn't exactly say evil genius, yeah. <laughs> but uh, like, but sort of like he knows what he's doing. Sure, this isn't an yeah. accident. These aren't good gaffes. This isn't a mental health problem. No. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. yeah, and he's doing it intentionally to energize his base and and solidify his power. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. So, and that's and f I think for him, that this is about like what he's going to get from the system. I don't think he's got any grand plan. Trump, you mm -hmm. mean, or you said Bush? Trump, Trump. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, said, I said Trump. If, so if Trump was a moron, yeah. I wouldn't. I mean, pardon me. If if Bush was the moron, right? I wouldn't exactly call uh, Trump an evil genius, but I think he right. knows what he's doing. Oh, okay. Um, okay. and I think it's about him seeing what he can get for himself. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh, oh, yeah. it's graft. Yes, like, it is. The that's whole, the, the Trump's whole thing, thing is graft. Yeah. The privatization of the presidency. Right. Yeah. And where, but this larger, broader thing that I see emerging. Where he's distorting the whole political landscape, mm -hmm. tilting the whole playing field, so that you know something to worry about. Yeah, that's ve that's very worrisome. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and I don't think he's doing that. It's not. Really, I don't think it's even him doing that. It's not really worrisome because now we're uncivil. No, that's not. That's the not the real worry. worry. Right. The real worry to me is that we're all arguing about his rudeness and how right. he was playing golf okay. when. Our neighbors are being rounded up and <laughs> <laughs> rounded up and herded out of the country. Yeah, I, I wonder. Mean, I wonder if yeah. you guys do, do. You see any consolation in thinking about the way in which what we are learning here on a national scale mm -hmm. is really the refutation of any notion of being exceptional? I think that's deeply valuable. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're all learning it. Well, yeah. I, I'm yeah. Here discovering what most of human history has known. Right. Um, just how how large national state systems, in particular, mm -hmm. can go bad, and 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 all the terrible repercussions of that. And so, because we've been in this exceptional bubble for about fifty or seventy years of prosperity that has cushioned us, yeah, the, from the yeah. black thing. Yeah. And so, when that uh, continues to unravel. Uh, then uh, it's it's a hard landing. Yeah, it like is. We're, we're just like any other country, you know? just like anyone else. I figure. Yeah, and it's in the same thing. You know, physics works for you too. Right. That's, yeah. Now it's yeah. it's like watching people. A few years ago, I went through a phase where I was very intensely studying all the climate change uh, data and information coming out. And I, I went through a period of mourning. I did a series mm -hmm. of, of recordings um, called Morning Valediction, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I was talking about climate change and talking about basically giving up my, I was trying to basically div uh, fully embrace a, a stoicism, you know, mm -hmm. about the future. That is uh, sort of a lack of hope, but at the same time, uh, hope for the short term. Yes. Yeah. You know, but... Um, People now are just starting to realize that, oh, maybe we're not going to fix this in time to prevent, you know, huge dislocations and population right. crashes right. and, right. you know, famine and whatnot. And watching them, it's a little similar, you know, right. it feels a little similar, like watching uh, watching it now happen to people that are realizing, wow, the Arctic's going a lot faster than we thought yeah. it was going to, yeah, right. uh, you know, and the fires and, you know, so you know, why you can't see out your backyard in Seattle, right? For example. Um, 
but it's, yeah. it's it feels a little similar like now people are having this political moment and right. they're they're seeing now in the realm of like governance and politics what i was seeing about climate change a few years back mm-hmm. yep yeah so uh so and i was commenting to someone that this sort of um normalization and then like this mass normalization because you know even uh obama served to normalize a lot of it yep yeah right really normal because this is the thing with the the child abductions at the border yeah um that was like new in degree right not new in policy it wasn't a new policy, just the way it was implemented. The way it was changed. implemented was new, right? Like the but this isn't around. new policy. Right. Its implementation was new. And we found that implementation egregious and started screaming about it as a nation, Yeah. largely because of this distortion syndrome, right? right? Mm-hmm. Where we're, well, now we're paying attention, right. and we can even see it or recognize it yeah. as grotesque. And some of us who have actually tried to pay attention all along are not are scratching our, our heads. heads like okay yeah. now it's bad all right cool you know yeah. and as soon as 45 dialed it back to basically the same policy as the obama administration mm-hmm. um the media basically moved on to the next walked uh, away yeah pile of bar- red meat and i see like individuals who will bring this back to the table and say this is still going on this is still happening like right. i they see still individuals ha- they haven't even met their court ordered you know, right. d- deliverable by right. date and that's like the so this is this is the sort of normalization has gone on been going on for a while right yeah. yep. yep but to see it sort of become um come forth as a standard bearer i was talking to a friend of mine online and i said you know i okay so i'm not i have no qualms about punching a nazi in the streets right mm-hmm. F- for example but i i don't have a good response to this right I don't. Yeah. I don't have like a real. What, I, what yeah. I feel is like a really good response to this, because yes, <laughs> Dan Carlin, the guy that does the uh, Common Sense podcast and right. Hardcore History, he's literally given up. He's done a couple shows where he just says, huh. "I don't know. We're in uncharted territory. Stop asking Stop me. Stop asking me. I don't know. Oh right? I've got no answers. For I have you. no answers for you. Uh-huh. And so yes, um, and we see that like the, the sort of the Antifa approach to the open fascist. Yeah. It was yeah. very yeah. effective at tamping down attendance. Right, at the the rallies. The for the next nations. rallies, right? Yeah. Where, where a lot of like physical violence happens on the streets and to specific targeted communities. Mm-hmm. So that's, we, we've got a, we got a strategy, an effective strategy for that. Right. I don't know what the effective strategy is for this. When and it's my the state. <laughs> right, right? Yeah. So my friend's response was, you know, there's only, all there ever is. There, there's community and righteous anger and solidarity. Yeah. Well, That's I, all there ever is. That's I take, all you can do. I take hope in a comment that I've heard Chris Hedges make, mm-hmm. which is like when some relatively small portion of the population, and it's not you know fifty percent, it's not ninety percent, it's, it's like ten percent, like, it's like ten percent, right. just refuse, you know, to participate. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Th- things change, and it, it, you you rally, you know, those that percent, you get you reach a certain point, and. <clears throat> They can't. The government can't continue. And they can't the keep doing what they're doing. In. They just can't do it. Right. Because, because they don't have plausible deniability anymore. Right. And right. also, there's the uh, it hits the economy too hard. Right. And so all their owners are angry at them. They're angry. I'm <laughs> losing not, money. But that's not how you get a big socialist revolution. That's how you get a. That's, uh, how, you, that's how you stop the fascist gulags. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, and so that's why this prison strike is so exciting to me. Yeah, that you know. Oh yeah, I mean, they already ended up like dropping um, phone rates. Yes, like the first, it's yeah. already it's, it's already, already having, impact. having some positive, some positive impacts impact. on the lives oh. of incarcerated. And the people. Oklahoma school teachers uh, busted loose. Yeah, yeah. That's so good. these strikes are really great. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad to see them. They're they're pushing the needle a little bit, a little bit, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and um, and some folks are waking up to some of this stuff. Yeah. But um. But yeah, what it ca- captured me when he said, you know, community and righteous anger and solidarity, mm-hmm. that's just how I define love, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's really the only weapon there is. And that's what gets no. you out of bed in the morning. Yeah. 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 That's right. All right, guys. I think, <clears throat> are we there? I think we're there. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us, Elias. Thank you A so pleasure. much. 
All right. Well, we find light in the darkness. That's we what we do. do. Yeah. <laughs> You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. Till next time. Bye, guys.